The Book of Lamentations, it's a unique book in the Old Testament that contains five poems from an anonymous author who survived and is now reflecting back on the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and the destruction and the exile that followed. Remember the whole story from the book of 2 Kings. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile was the most horrendous catastrophe in Israel's history up to this point. So remember, God had promised Abraham the land. He'd given David victory to make Jerusalem Israel's capital. And from David came the royal line of kings. You had God's presence there in the temple, and that's where the priests maintained the rituals of Israel's worship. And after 500 years of all of this history, in the summer of 587 BC, the city fell to Babylon. It was all decimated and gone. And so the Book of Lamentations is a memorial to the pain and confusion of the Israelites that followed this destruction. Now, the lament poems found here are not unique in the Bible. There's lots of them in the book of Psalms. And these biblical poems of lament, they do a number of things. They're a form of protest. They're a way of drawing everybody's attention, including God's attention, to the horrible things that happen in this world that should not be tolerated. They're a way of processing emotion. So in these poems, God's people vent their anger and dismay at the ruin caused by people's sin and selfishness. And these poems are a place to voice confusion. Suffering makes us ask questions about God's character and promises, and none of this is looked down on in the Bible. Just the opposite. These poems of lament give a sacred dignity to human suffering. And so these human words of grief that are addressed to God have now become part of God's word to his people. The design of these five poems is very intentional. It's part of the book's message. So chapters one through four are called acrostics, which means alphabet poems. Each poetic verse begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is made up of 22 letters. Now this very ordered and linear structure, it's in stark contrast to the disorder of the pain and the confused grief that's explored in these poems. So it's like Israel's suffering is explored A to Z, and is trying to express something that is inexpressible. Chapters one and two each have one verse per letter, giving them a really similar design, but the themes are very different. So chapter one focuses on the grief and shame of a figure called Lady Zion. The poet personifies the city of Jerusalem as a widow, also called the daughter of Zion. And she sits alone. She's bereaved of her loved ones, devastated. No one comes to comfort her. It's a very powerful metaphor. And then Lady Zion speaks. She calls on the Lord to notice her fate. And through this image, the poet, he's showing that the city's destruction brought a level of psychological trauma on the Israelites that can only be expressed as the experience of a funeral and the death of a loved one. Chapter 2 focuses on the fall of Jerusalem and how it was a consequence of Israel's sin and was brought about by God's wrath which is a key word in this poem. Now, it's important to remember that in the Bible, God's wrath is not spontaneous, volatile anger. The biblical poets and prophets, they use this word to talk about God's justice. So Israel had entered a covenant agreement with God, and for centuries they've been violating it by worshiping other gods, perpetrating injustice, oppressing the poor. And so, yes, God is slow to anger, but he eventually does get angry at human evil, and he will bring his justice just anger in the form of punishment. In the case of Jerusalem, this involved allowing Babylon to come and conquer the city. And so this poem is acknowledging that God's wrath is justified, but this doesn't keep the poet from lamenting and asking God to show compassion once again. Chapter 3 breaks this design pattern by having three verses per letter, so it's the longest poem in the book. And the voice is that of a lonely man speaking out of his suffering and grief as a representative of the whole people. And what's interesting is that this chapter is full of language that's drawn from other parts of the Old Testament, from the laments of Job and from other important lament psalms and even from the suffering servant poems in Isaiah. And the poet sees his hardship as a form of God's justice, like chapter 2 said. But paradoxically, this is what gives the poet hope. And it leads him to offer the only hopeful words in the whole book. Because of the Lord's covenant faithfulness, we do not perish. His mercies never fail. They're new every morning. How great is your faithfulness, O God. So I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. So the poet reasons, if God is consistent enough to bring his justice on human evil, then he'll also be consistent with his covenant promise to not allow evil to get the final word. And so for this poet, God's judgment is the seedbed of hope for the future.
Chapter 4 goes back to the same alphabet structure as chapters 1 and 2, and is a vivid and disturbing depiction of the two-year siege in Jerusalem. And it contrasts how things used to be in Jerusalem of the past and how terrible they became in the siege. So children used to laugh and play in the streets, but now they beg for food. The wealthy used to eat lavish meals, but now they eat whatever they can find in the dirt. And the royal leaders used to be full of splendor, but now they're famished and dirty and unrecognizable. And the anointed king from the line of David has been captured and dragged away. So the poem's power comes from the shock of these contrasts, and it's exploring the depth of the suffering that Israel brought on itself. Now the final poem is unique because it breaks the design pattern. It's the same length as all of the other alphabet poems, but the alphabet order is gone. It's like the poet can't hold it together anymore and his grief has exploded back into chaos. The poem is a communal prayer for God's mercy. Israel begs God not to ignore their suffering or abandon them. And the poem offers a long list of all of the different kinds of people who were devastated by the fall of the city. They ask God not to forget these people, and they lament on behalf of others, giving voice to their pain. Suffering in silence is just not a virtue in this book. God's people are not asked to deny their emotions, but voice their protest to vent their feelings and pour it all out before God. The book ends with something of a paradox. The poet acknowledges that God is the eternal king of the world, but also that Israel's circumstances make them feel like God is nowhere to be found. And so the final words of the book leave this tension totally unresolved. It asks, unless you've totally rejected us, and the book ends. The poet doesn't offer a nice, neat conclusion, much like our own experiences of pain and suffering. The story of the Bible doesn't end here, but this very important book shows us how lament and prayer and grief are a crucial part of the journey of faith of God's people in a broken world. And that's what the book of Lamentations is all about. Lamentations Lamentations 1 How lonely sits the city that was full of people! How like a widow has she become! She who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night, with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers from days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Therefore her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things. For she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. 
They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, and see, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire. Into my bones he made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. By his hand they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me. One to revive my spirit, my children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear, all you peoples, and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street the sword bereaves. In the house it is like death. They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble, and they are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced. Now let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you, and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many, and my heart is faint. Lamentations 2 how the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe. And he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds. And he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. 
the law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city, they cry to their mothers. Oh, where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom, what can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty? The joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss. They gnash their teeth. They cry, We have swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we longed for. Now we have it. We see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and see. With whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised my enemy destroyed. <laughs>